Hi, everyone. Welcome to Be True, my podcast about the writing I love and the writing I do. I promise I won't rhyme the whole time. I'm John Tessitore, and today, a little 90s nostalgia and maybe some righteous 90s anger with a poem called It Is Easier to Be Earnest from my little book for a minute there. It seemed like something was happening, which is available at my website, johntessitore.com. So here's how you know you're getting old. You start thinking that you remember a time when things seemed entirely different. And you start telling everyone you know. You know, things used to be entirely different. Now, for a lot of us, especially for us New Yorkers, the pivot moment is clear. September 11th, 2001. A lot of opportunity and momentum and positive energy came to an abrupt halt on that terrible, terrible day. For me, there was a before and there was an after. The after may be the same for all of us. A closing, a darkness, a limit in the way that we interacted with the world, a fear. But the before? Well, I was in my early 20s. I was a magazine writer in New York City. In the, in the midst of the dot-com boom. There was action. There was music. There was one world. There was a world wide web. There was information everywhere. There were lights and neon flashing signs. There was still that sense of victory about the rise of American capitalism over the collapse of Soviet communism, for better or worse. When George Herbert Walker Bush mentioned that there would be a new world order, he did not mean the web, but in fact... That's kind of how it felt, especially in New York City in the late 1990s. To me, it seemed like something was happening. That feeling is the subject of my little book and what led to the feeling, my own journey, the country's journey. These are the things the book is about. The optimism in that poem, in my poem, is often expressed in a kind of poeticized pop song rhythm. This is the poem in which I scat and do a little bebop. But there's definitely a strain of regret that goes through the whole thing, including that title. We are not where I thought we were headed. And in fact, there was a darker critique going on at the same time. A tendency to see vast potential in the country, but also to to distrust the people and the institutions of power. To doubt whether we'd ever get there in the first place. Frankly, I wish I'd had a better sense of that turn at the time. That's what today's poem is about. It's about regretting that you didn't quite see the darkness in all of that neon. This poem's a little long, but it builds, I think, to an important ending. It is easier to be earnest. There are always good reasons for serious questions. One need not look too far to find them. Not my bulldog brain, not my mind with a bone. I gnaw from the safety of my home. But how do we survive when we know we can't win? How do we press on with righteous indignation when we never, ever seem to get no satisfaction? Never mind. We almost grew accustomed to the casual greed. We almost grew accustomed to the bullying. We almost grew accustomed to the confident excuses. We almost grew accustomed to the surgical strike overproduced like a game show on the all-day news. I believed in belief, so I was slow to see the benefit of the public retreat, the withholding, of finding a small corner and staying there until the stupidity blew over. A more complicated choice, for sure, to douse the pain with irony. I did not see the trees for the forest. I did not see the hopelessness. I tried and failed to think So here is my contrite elegy for a real artist, another insignificant act of penance, a useless atonement for a blindness, how blind I can be in the heat of the moment. I call it presumptuousness. I tried my best to bury you. When I heard the news, my head was full of my own voice, not your croak from the back of the class, but mine from the front, the future. I was right. You were dead. A logic so compact it seemed to work in reverse. You were dead. I was right. And I tried my best to bury you. 
You can hear in this section of the longer book, The Earnest Righteous Irony and Detachment, the late 90s tendency to stand at the edge of the culture, look in, and tell everyone else to fuck off, even as you can't help but participate. I struggled with that for a very long time. I was a young guy with ambitions, and I was pretty successful in the mainstream. I was also a guy committed to the culture, American culture, as a subject of study. I was heading to grad school to be a cultural literary historian. I was way too snobby to see my way through all of that rebellion of one kind or another, that ironic detachment. I wasn't interested in detachment. I wanted to live it full. And I tried my best to ignore the dark. And I tried my best to bury the dark figures that surrounded me. So who was the real artist I tried my hardest to bury? Come on, folks. I graduated high school in 1992. I wore flannels and baggy jeans. The artist was Kurt Cobain. I had a very weird relationship with Kurt Cobain. The first time I heard his music, my friend said, what do you think? And I said, it's too noisy for me to hear. (laughs) And then I ultimately, like everyone else, I did hear it. And it didn't take long to love it. But what I resented no surprise to anybody listening to this podcast, probably, is all of that talk of the poet of our generation. That swirled around him at the time, and especially after his death. The poet of his generation. An albino, a mosquito, a libido. (laughs) I hadn't written anything yet, but I was the fucking poet of the fucking generation. (laughs) Truth is, I was too inside my own brain, my own culture, my own underwear, to understand the suspicion or the anger behind his words. And quite frankly, I was a fool. And several years ago, I jotted the bit that ends this poem, that bit about burying. I was thinking about my own failure to see where all the darkness in America was coming from. And I decided that I needed to make an apology to Kurt as if he needed one. Probably should have sent it to Courtney. Uh, And and that little poem came back to me when I was in the middle of writing the bright, happy, nostalgic moments of, for a minute there, it seemed like something happening. It was was an epiphany for me. Oh, right, it wasn't all neon lights and multi-ethnic mixing and Eurobeats. There was a lot right with that period of America and that there was a lot wrong. A rampant capitalism is as destructive as it is constructive. Lots of people get hurt when money is made. Then the bubble bursts. Then the terrorists arrive on our shores. And intolerance is always just beneath the surface. And we're fighting that battle today. And I wish I'd fought harder at the time. And yes, my poem is in part another insignificant act of penance. A useless atonement for a blindness. But you gotta start somewhere. And so with my head full of loud distortion, deafening feedback, and vocal fry. This is John Tessitore concluding this installment of Be True. If you've listened this long, thank you. You can find more about my work, including for a minute there, it seemed like something was happening at johntessitore.com. But seriously, first, go find Nevermind, replay it for the thousandth time. If you listen hard enough, it may just make you a better person. Special thanks to me, for today's theme music, which I call A Chord. Maybe we'll talk again. And if you enjoyed this little podcast, tell all your friends. In the meantime, I gotta feed the dog. All right, Luna, I'm coming. Mm-hmm.